So last week we looked at Isaiah 49 and we argued that God was faithful to Israel through the sending of this servant and through the controlling of the nations. And we're learning more and more every week as we unpack this section of Isaiah about this servant of the Lord and that it was God's plan for salvation to be revealed not only to Israel but also to all of the nations. And as we come to Isaiah 50 today, we're going to learn another piece of information about this servant of the Lord. So as we begin this morning, let's pray. Almighty God and most merciful Father, we humbly submit ourselves and we fall down before your majesty, asking you from the bottom of our hearts that this seed of your word, now sown among us, would take such deep root that neither the burning heat of persecution cause it to wither, nor the thorny cares of this life choke it, but that as seed sown in good ground, it would produce 30, 60, or 100-fold, as your heavenly wisdom has appointed. Amen. So remember some of the key questions that we've been asking throughout this study of Isaiah. These are the questions that Israel has been asking. Does God care for them? Has God abandoned them? Will they be in exile in Babylon forever? Is he faithful to the covenant that he had made with them in previous generations? All of these questions are circulating in the minds of the Israelites as Isaiah speaks on behalf of God in this prophecy. And the questions that the Israelites are asking are the same questions that you and me ask. When we experience trials and circumstances in our life, does God care about us? Has God abandoned us? Will he be faithful to us? Can I trust the covenant that he said he would make with me? All of these things are applicable to us today in 2024, just as they were to the Israelites thousands of years ago. So it still matters. And I think we learn from this chapter one big truth, and it is this. That God redeems his people through the perfection of his servant, which should ultimately lead to trust and obedience from the people of God. So let me read Isaiah 50 this morning. Thus says the Lord, Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you were sold." And for your transgressions, your mother was sent away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no one to answer? Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, by my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a desert. Their fish stink for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness, and make sackcloth their covering. The Lord has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. I lost my place. There we go. Morning by morning, he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord And rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled. This you have from my hand. You shall lie down 
in torment. So the point, God redeems his people through the perfection of his servant, which should lead to trust and obedience from the people of God. This chapter begins with asking two questions. Number one, where is the certificate of divorce? And number two, to whom have I sold you? In other words, God is asking the Israelites in this moment to prove that he has abandoned them. And of course the answer is, he hasn't. The certificate of divorce takes us back to Deuteronomy 24. It was a way for the husband to legally divorce a wife. And no certificate of divorce, Isaiah says, was ever extended to Israel. Meaning, God did not break his covenant with his people. In addition, he has also not sold them off to clear a debt. So God has not abandoned them. However, due to their iniquities, due to their transgressions, they were sent away. And they were sent away into exile. And so the principle that we take from this beginning of the passage is that sin always has consequences. And just because sin brings consequences doesn't mean that God stops being our father. If you are a parent in the room, you know this truth very well. You, do not turn to, you don't turn a blind eye to disobedience or to sin in the lives of your children. You discipline them. You bring consequences to them. But you never abandon them. You remain their loving father, their loving mother. So yes, God is gracious and he is merciful towards his people, but he does not turn a blind eye to sin. The consequences for sin always must be dealt with. And they might look different based on the severity of the sin, based on the situation, but God has to deal with sin. Because he is a God of justice. And if God were to turn a blind eye to sin, he would cease to be God. So we simultaneously hold these truths together. That God is just, but he is also merciful and gracious towards sinners like you and me. So we can worship God for the grace and the mercy that he extends to us through his son Jesus. But we don't need to be complaining or be surprised when we face consequences for our disobedience. Grace and mercy are not the absence of sin's consequences. We know that for all in Christ, the eternal consequences of our sin have been poured out on Jesus. But temporal consequences for our sin still remain. And because of Israel's sin, they did experience consequences. Specifically, the consequence of exile, being taken from their homeland, sent away to a foreign nation. Now clearly, God does not turn a blind eye to their sin. But even as they experienced consequences for their sin, he never ceased to be their father. He continues to pursue them. He continues to care for them. He made a covenant with them, and God always remains faithful to his covenant promises. So we must be careful, brothers and sisters, not to assume that because our life, perhaps at the moment, is free of difficulty, that that somehow means we are free from sin. Because we're always going to battle sin. Confession of sin and repentance of sin is not a one-time thing. It is a daily discipline that followers of Christ practice. When we go before him every day, we confess our sin to him, and we ask that by his Holy Spirit we would turn from that sin and we would recommit our faith and our trust in Christ. It's not a one-time thing. It's a daily discipline that we as followers of Jesus engage in. And we learn in verse 2 that when God approached Israel, none of them were there. Instead of answering his call, they were still blaming God for their circumstances. So God asks them the question, Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? God is asking the Israelites this. These are questions that he is posing to them. But of course, we as the readers, we know the answers to these. No, his hand is not too short to redeem. Yes, he does have the power to deliver. 
And the argument that he makes in this passage to prove that he can still redeem and that he is powerful is to take us back to the seminal event in the nation of Israel, which is the Exodus. This is the event in the nation of Israel that in the Old Testament and even today, Jews go back to and talk about all of the time how God was faithful to them. So look, in Isaiah, he says he dried up the sea. This takes us back to Exodus 14, verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. So he did that. But he also caused the fish to stink when he turned the water into blood, Exodus 7, 21. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank. So the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. What about the darkness, clothing the heavens with blackness? This is Exodus 10, 21 and 22. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. A darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. What's God telling the Israelites here? If I can do these phenomenal things through creation, I can most definitely redeem you from exile. If God can raise his son from the dead, then surely, brothers and sisters, there's nothing that God can't accomplish Do you doubt right now that God can reconcile a troubled relationship? Let me just encourage you. He raised Jesus from the dead. He can do this. Do you doubt that God is going to provide for you and your family? Let me encourage you. He raised Jesus from the dead. Do you doubt his willingness or his power to forgive you of your sin? Let me remind you. He raised Jesus from the dead. He can do all of these things and more. He is powerful enough to do it. So we learn in these first three verses that yes, God is going to redeem his people. And then we learn in verses 4 through 9 that it will be through the perfection of his servant. And the servant himself is the one speaking now in these verses. And the language indicates That it is God who has worked through this servant. In verse 4, it is God who gave this servant the tongue of those who are taught. This indicates that the servant's message is prophetic. It comes from God himself. The servant's words will sustain the one who is weary. In particular, the one who is weary of justifying themselves in the flesh. How exhausting it must be for those who believe that the way to God is through one's personal effort, through one's personal goodness and morality. So it's no surprise to me that we live in what social psychologist Jonathan Haidt calls the most anxious generation in the history of the world. Because we have people that are looking for meaning and fulfillment and purpose through their own efforts and their own goodness. And that is no way to live your life. The gospel, on the other hand, teaches that one's identity is fulfilled in the accomplishment of another on their behalf. Brothers and sisters, we cannot live up to the standard. Whatever standard we have created in our mind, we will never be able to live up to it. But praise God through Jesus. We worship someone who did live up to it. He lived up to it perfectly and in every way. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Following Jesus does not mean freedom from a life of worry and a life of anxiety. But the anxiety that comes from trying to live a perfect life. Or the anxiety that comes from constantly trying to live up to some standard that either we have created or society has created. It's it's overwhelming. It's a burden that we've not actually been created to bear. Whether that be 
an ACT score, or a college scholarship, being the best baseball player, getting the highest paying job, getting married, having children, the list could go on and on. You cannot live up to those standards. There is always going to be someone, I'm talking to myself now, there's always going to be someone who's going to be disappointed in you, who, who knows that you let them down. But Jesus offers something far greater to us. And here's what he offers in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of Mark. Here's what he tells Andrew and Peter. In spite of everything he could have said, he tells them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's all we need to do. That's what God has called us to do, to follow him and allow him to use us to make other disciples Just like Peter and Andrew many, many years ago. This servant here is awakened by God and he has perfect intimacy with God. He hears from God perfectly and he perfectly teaches the ways of God. And God has opened his ears and he is the example of perfect obedience. Look at verses 5 and 6. I, this is the servant talking, I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. This servant is the opposite of how Israel often behaved and how we behave. I am rebellious. The speed limit tells me to go 70 and I go 77 and I feel good about it because I'm not going 80. So I'm rebellious. I am sinful. I am corrupt. I compare myself to other people whose moral compass is worse than mine so that I feel better about my inadequacies and my sin. I look at the speck in other people's eyes and ignore the log that is in my eye. This is what we do. We are rebellious. We turn our backs away from God. Israel regularly abandoned God to worship false idols so that they could get the blessings from what these false gods claimed they could give them. They ran from God. They turned away from him. But he never runs. This servant never turned away. He never ran back from the calling that God placed on his life. When we start the Gospel of Luke in about a month, we're going to be focusing on Luke 1 to 9.50. And you might be thinking, that's a really weird place to stop. But something very specific happens in chapter 9, verse 51. And so most scholars divide up that gospel at that point. And here's what happens in verse 51. It says, when the days drew near for him, being Jesus, to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And that is Luke telling us from verse 51 of chapter 9 all the way to the remainder of the gospel in chapter 24. It is Jesus on a date with his destiny to be crucified and to be resurrected. Jesus knew this and he set his face toward Jerusalem and he kept walking in that direction. In spite of everything that he knew would happen to him, he never turned around. He never went backwards. He didn't cower in fear. He approached his destiny in perfect obedience, knowing that it would cost him his life. He was spit upon. He was disgraced as he marched his way to Golgotha. He faced the humiliation of the crowds, and he could endure all of this because he trusted his father perfectly. This is the servant that we worship. Look at verses 7 through 9. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth 
will be eaten up. This servant has the power of God in him. He will not be disgraced. He will not be put to shame. He will be vindicated. Verses 8 and 9 take us back to this courtroom scene that we have actually seen a lot in these chapters of Isaiah. No adversary can stand up to this servant and no prosecutor can declare that this servant is guilty. The perfection of God himself is in this servant. He can do no wrong. And in the same way, all of those that are in Christ today are also declared not guilty. But here's the kicker. Unlike the servant who was not rebellious, we are rebellious. And we have turned away from God. And yet we are still vindicated. Christians are vindicated, not because of our own effort or our own good works, but because of Jesus' good work on our behalf. The servant is vindicated because of his perfection. We are vindicated because of the servant's perfection in us. Christ's righteousness has been imputed to all of those in Christ, and our sin has been imputed to him. This is the beauty of the gospel. That Christ takes on our sin so that we might become the righteousness of God when we turn from our sin and we place our faith in Christ. So, non-Christian, did you know that if you place your faith in Christ, there is no condemnation for you? Romans 8.1 There is therefore now no condemnation For those that are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what anyone says about you. It doesn't matter what you have done. The Lord can help you. The Lord can save you. He can redeem you. His hand is not too short for you. His power is not too weak for you. One commentator said about verse 9, The servant is confident that with the help of his defense attorney, no prosecuting attorney would even have a case. It would never be presented, let alone come to trial. Anyone who did dare to stand up to him would be as insubstantial as a worn-out garment full of moth holes. The perfection of the servant on behalf of God's people leads to a response from God's people, which is trust and obedience. The question is asked in verse 10. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Fearing the Lord and obeying the servant doesn't necessarily mean that everything will be easy. Because right after he says that, he describes one who is walking in darkness and has no light. So fearing the Lord and obedience to God requires great trust in God because it doesn't always equate to worldly success. We are to trust the Lord even amidst the darkness and the trials of life. In fact, part of our sanctification, brothers and sisters, is the afflictions that we actually endure in this life. Thomas Watson in All Things for Good, I quote it all the time. He says, As the hard frosts in winter bring on the flowers in the spring, and as the night ushers in the morning star, so the evils of affliction produce much good to those that love God. When we only trust and obey God, when life is easy, We don't always learn as much as when we trust and obey God in times of trials and in times of affliction. And you know the reason why that is? Because when life is going well, we're less dependent on God. We just are. We wish it wasn't the case, but many times when life is going easy and smooth and successful, it's not that we're not in the Word, it's not that we're not praying But when things are going well, the desperation level for God is often not what it is during times of trials and during times of afflictions. 
And so our prayer should be that the desperation level that we have for God during the trials and afflictions would match the desperation we have for God when everything is going well. When life does seem to be going the way that we want it to. So we trust God, we obey God in not only the good times, but also in those trials and afflictions that come our way. In verse 11, we see here a picture of those who try to do things on their own. Walk, it says, by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled. The Israelites, Christians today, lost people are all guilty of trying to figure things out on our own. I'm prone to come up with a plan of how to do things completely in my flesh without ever consulting God. In our Bible reading plan this week, we had a great example of this in the story of the Israelites as they request a king. They didn't ask God, hey, what do you think about us having a king? They demanded a king. And they went straight to Samuel, and Samuel gave them a warning. You want a king? Here's what's going to happen if you ask God for a king. He gave them the consequences of that decision, and what did they do? They asked for a king anyways. Even with the consequences being told to them ahead of time, they wanted it that bad. And that's no different than us. God has given us clear instructions in his word of how he wants us to live, and we know how he wants us to live, and yet we still disobey. And we still experience consequences when it happens. And we do the things that we're told not to do in God's word. This is Paul's argument in Romans. I do the very things that I know I'm not supposed to do. But for whatever reason, I keep doing them. It's a daily waging war against the flesh. Walking by the Spirit, not in the flesh. This servant of the Lord in this passage fulfills God's perfect instructions. He is worthy of trust and obedience. We often hear the expression that trust has to be earned. Who has earned more trust with people than this servant? Who has been more faithful to do everything God has called him to do than this servant of the Lord? On June 9th, 2003, there was an Indonesian pastor who was leading Sunday services for his congregation. He was challenging them and encouraging them, praying with people, and he spent a relaxing afternoon at home with his family. And at 5 o'clock that evening, a man knocked on the door and asked the pastor to come with him. The pastor grabbed his Bible, and he set off with this individual. And after a few hours of being gone, the pastor's wife and family were concerned. So they gathered up some neighbors and they searched for him for hours. He was nowhere to be found. And the wife returned to her home and she saw someone lying in the front yard. And her husband's body was covered with bruises and he had wounds around his neck from being strangled. There were local Indonesian Muslims who had told this pastor that if he did not stop holding church services, if he did not stop encouraging people and praying for people and, and taking care of his flock, that danger would happen to him. And this pastor chose to ignore those warnings. He chose to trust and obey. That no matter what might happen to him as a result of his faithfulness in this life, that he would be rewarded in the next life. He chose trust and obedience, even though the path was dark, if he did so. The Israelites, they needed that reminder to trust and obey. Even when the path is dark, even when it seems like there's no way out of exile, we need to trust and obey, even when our path is dark. And by the Holy Spirit, we can do this. Because Jesus himself trusted and obeyed his Father in the darkness of the cross. We have an example of someone who was faithful, who did trust and obey, who did experience affliction, who did experience darkness, and he stayed the course. 
because God has redeemed his people through the perfection of this servant, we as the people of God have an obligation to trust and obey in the same way, no matter what this life might bring us. Let's pray. God, we praise you for the sending of Jesus, this perfect servant of the Lord who set his face toward Jerusalem and never turned back. He remained faithful and obedient to the calling that you placed on his life, no matter what it meant. God, we today are like the Israelites. We often doubt your your power We doubt your faithfulness to us. We doubt that you can do impossible things. But we thank you for this word of encouragement that Isaiah gives us. That your hand is not too short to redeem. Your power is not too weak to deliver us from whatever it is we have going on in our lives. And even if you never deliver us from it in this life, we have hope in the next life that we will be in your presence. And that leads us to worship. You are worthy of our praise. Amen.